The City of Angels, the City by the Bay, and the Emerald City. Behind these stunning skylines, you'll find cities in crisis, plagued by drugs, mental illness, crime, and disease. We have not seen conditions for humans like this since medieval times. It's all out in the open, lives spinning out of control. This is not right. The Project Seattle team traveled up and down the West Coast to show you what's really happening. A tale of three cities should be a wake-up call for Seattle to find solutions before it's too late. We need to tackle this together. Hello, everybody. I'm Eric Johnson. By now, you're aware that there's a battle going on. It is a battle for the soul of the West Coast of the United States. Famously, it is happening here in Seattle. But it's also happening in San Francisco and Los Angeles and in places like Portland and Spokane and Sacramento and San Diego and so on. It is a clash of policy and philosophy, and caught in the middle are people who are suffering and need help, whether they know it or not, whether they accept it or not. What's at stake in this fight, you ask? This increasingly loud discussion that's now echoing coast to coast? What's at stake is nothing less than everything. We're going to look at the problems of homelessness, addiction, disease, and crime through the prism of three cities. A few months ago, we called our leaders and policymakers out by telling you what the situation was really about, a crisis of addiction. And we showed you how homelessness and crime are the byproducts of the addiction. We asked, how can allowing this suffering on our streets be the right course? How can allowing our city and our way of life to be ruined be the right course? The show was called Seattle is Dying. It was really nothing more than a mirror that we held up to ourselves so that Seattle might look at itself through fresh eyes. What we saw was the pain and the suffering on our streets that we have been conditioned to ignore, the misery pits that have become home to our most vulnerable, collections of tents, camps where there is no sanitation, no law, little hope. How can this be the right thing to do? How can watching human beings live and die in filth and degradation and madness be right? In the six months since Seattle is Dying aired, most of the camps that were seen in the drone shots on the program have been cleared. The mayor quietly went about removing them. But the people in the camps have simply moved to new camps. Many went to county property along I-5. The misery continues, and the city, county, and state policies that allow it, even nurture it, continue as well. I have not met anyone else on the street who's not in some phase of addiction. We showed you how we have, in effect, legalized narcotics on our streets. Six months ago, unofficially of course, anything less than three grams or 30 doses of heroin or meth, we no longer bothered to prosecute, so the police didn't bother to arrest. But that has actually changed. Police officers in an honest moment will tell you that the three gram rule is now a seven gram rule. In Seattle, 70 doses of heroin or meth will get you nothing. This is a list of familiar faces, repeat offenders, people who break the laws. Get... We examined the system failure report commissioned by the Downtown Seattle Association. It told the story of 100 prolific offenders who cycled through the criminal justice system over and over and over again. 40, 50, 60 arrests, assaults, robberies. Rarely was there meaningful resolution or accountability for any of them. We needed a more focused approach to have on repeat offenders and for those who are not receiving the appropriate interventions. In September, Mayor Jenny Durkin put together a work group with police, judges, prosecutors, and other city leaders. It led to four new pilot programs, including an enhanced probation program as an alternative to jail. But the 100 prolific offenders in the system failure report weren't the problem. They were a symptom of the problem. The problem was a criminal justice system that was broken. System Failure Part 2 just came out, and yes, the system is still broken. Nearly two out of every three cases referred to the city attorney's office by the police department do not result in any meaningful resolution. Seattle is Dying gave voice to store owners and citizens who were infuriated by what has happened to their city and their parks and their neighborhoods. It's, uh, it's gotten to a point where I'm embarrassed of it. I, I don't want to have my friends and family come here anymore. This is just this, this is just a bunch of. This is not right. 
nothing has changed, except that Bartell Drugs is closing a downtown store because of safety issues, and Macy's, decimated by shoplifting, is finished. And the people running scores of other businesses feel like they are left to fend for themselves. If we're taking a hands-off approach and the police are taking a hands-off approach, then the only people who have hands on anything is the criminals on our stuff. I'm pissed for my tenants and all the small businesses and, and their employees and their visitors that come to the city that come here and get violated by the same repeat offenders. The show also gave voice to cops who were furious because they haven't been able to police because they've been powerless from their front row seats to stop the breakdown of law and order. We're running a concentration camp without barbed wire up to and including the medical experiment of poisoning these people with drugs. I, I don't know how else to put it and it's infuriating. Since then, Chief Carmen Best acknowledged the disconnect. We are losing good people, and we know that it's because they feel like they're not supported by public officials, and we need to have that done. And lastly, Seattle is Dying took us on a trip to Rhode Island, where medication-assisted treatment in the prison with an intensive network of follow-up care on the outside has had much success. The resulting publicity because of Seattle is Dying was so overwhelming that the people in Rhode Island who run the program found it necessary to hold a two-day seminar Officials from municipalities and counties from all over the country showed up to learn. But from Seattle, King County, and the state of Washington, not so much as a single phone call. The trap we have set for ourselves through policy that holds hardly anyone accountable for hardly anything is still set. We showed you an addiction and mental illness crisis disguised as a housing crisis. The Northwest disguised as the Wild West. It's been six months since Seattle is Dying first aired, and there is at least one thing that the city, its businesses, and its citizens agree upon. It's the opening line of City Attorney Pete Holmes' response to the System Failure Part 2 report. He said, nothing has changed since these issues were flagged in the Business Association's first report. It truly is amazing. And when we come back, we're going to go to San Francisco to see how that city is dealing with problems that are at least the equal of what we're dealing with here in Seattle. newest arrivals are on sale this holiday weekend at more furniture for less you'll find sale pricing in every department throughout the showroom the newest styles for your home are in stock and on sale get our guaranteed lowest prices on everything store-wide it's this holiday weekend at more furniture for less preview sale items online at morefurniture.com with the all-new Silverado HD, Silverado is now the only truck brand that can offer trucks with best-in-class towing, or trucks with best-in-class camera technology, or larger, more functional beds than any competitor. The only truck that can compare to a Silverado is another Silverado. Or qualified lessees can lease this Silverado Custom with a larger, more functional bed than any competitor for around $3.29 a month. Or during truck month, make no monthly payments for 90 days when you purchase. There are similarities between Seattle and San Francisco. Both are port cities on the West Coast. Both are stunningly beautiful. And both have been crippled by a homeless crisis, which we all understand now is really an addiction and mental illness crisis. Matt Markovich went to San Francisco to look at their situation, their policies, and what they're trying to do to right the ship. It's so out in the open. The despair, the misery, People walking by, not even batting an eye to the crisis they're stepping over. And this is where the convergence of homelessness, drug addiction, and mental illness takes place in San Francisco. It's an area known as the Tenderloin. Of the city's 9,000 homeless, nearly half are concentrated in this 30-block area. That's human feces right there. Right there. It's human sh I see that 10 times a day. Brandon lives on the streets of the Tenderloin. This is just homelessness, drug use, and all of it at its madness. His perspective is unique. 
He's from Monroe, Washington, and was homeless on the streets of Seattle. Can you make a comparison between the two? Um, I'd say it's more chaotic here. Drug, it's easier to get him here than it is there. He's a heroin addict, but just switched to smoking fentanyl. The dangerous opiate hit the tenderloin big time five months ago. So where do you get the money to get it? I fly a sign. He found San Franciscans give more freely than those out there Seattle lights. Out there, they're like, oh, you're just going to spend it on drugs. It's, not, it's normal for them out here. They already know. Like, people come up and give it to you. They're like, I don't care what you're doing with this. This has always been a wild child. But there are reasons why the Tenderloin has become the epicenter of the city's homeless crisis. A lot of these hotels started renting on a short-term rental basis. Pam Coates was once homeless in the Tenderloin, now leads walking tours that include old hotels that would need major renovations to get those high rents. Instead, they're low-income housing. And then, because it was affordable low-income housing, the city decided that anywhere they needed to put something nobody else wanted, like homeless outreach, they put it here. For every 10 rooms, there's a shared shower and toilet. Kathy Looper owns the famous Cadillac Hotel, turned it into housing for low-income and the homeless. The building would be obsolete if she didn't do that. Who wants to share a bath? in today's world, mm -hmm. but it's perfect for this type of housing. 10,000 units of housing were created this way. Seattle doesn't have anything similar in scale, but it does have a housing first agenda. Housing first is a, is a great concept, but you have to have those other services. You have to provide the other services. Otherwise, they stop paying their rent because they're using their money for drugs. They end up back on the street, and it's a, just a circular problem that keeps repeating itself. These guys across the street are selling drugs and using drugs there pretty much all day and all night. It's a rinse and repeat county supervisor Matt Haney sees every day. His district includes the Tenderloin, lives on the block. Stat show is the dirtiest crime ridden block in the city. The problem is that we're pushing people with high needs, whether people who have drug addiction or mental health crises, and we're not actually helping them. He says the mayor and others have made the Tenderloin a containment zone concentrating social services here because of the concentration of subsidized housing, tolerating the street camping here, where elsewhere in the city it's not. Well, we have a, a, a failing shelter system, a failing mental health system, and a failing uh, housing system. So I think you do have to treat all of them at the same time. And that's what we heard from business owners and street campers over and over again. I sleep here on the streets of the city. For 10 years, Rosha has a drug addiction. They should skip over shelters and go to a person's needs like mental drug addiction and everyone should go to a different place like programs, veterans should go there and just throw everybody in one place. She says the Tenderloin Containment Zone idea isn't working. And only putting us in like certain areas where it's unsafe, where it's overpopulated with drugs, that's what they're doing. The mayor, uh, London Breed. <laughs> The filth on the street is disgusting, yes. This isn't just dirt. Apartment manager Larry Gothberg washes human feces from the planters in front of his building. If I don't do it, it won't get done. Human poop is a huge problem. The city cleans feces off the sidewalks if someone reports it on the city's 311 app, similar to Seattle's Find It, Fix It app. It's logged more than 28,000 reports in San Francisco of human poop last year. But despite a city policy that tolerates camping in front of businesses, it's become the obligation of businesses to keep its sidewalks clean. I'll see people going in between parked cars like that and taking a sh**. It's absolutely foul. In response, the city now runs a fleet of 11 mobile pit stops, many calling it a success. The key, they're always supervised. No packages allowed inside, and you've got five minutes. Seattle is considering its own fleet. Despite all that's being done, everyone we spoke with said it's not enough. And Matt, is there anything else that they're doing in that city to somehow try to get ahead of this thing? Well, San Francisco is a big believer of housing first, like Seattle is. But what San Francisco did was able to get the buy-in with big business. They were able to pass a voter-approved Proposition C tax on big business, and they were really specific on how that money was going to be spent, $300 million just for affordable housing. Now, Seattle tried a, a head tax, which failed. They were very vague on how the money would be spent, but they also attacked big business as the blame 
for a lot of the ho housing problems and the homeless problems in Seattle, and that's why it failed in Seattle. When we come back, a look at addiction and disease in the City of Angels. At Pacific Heating and Cooling, you can fall into savings before bad weather arrives with this amazing deal. Right now, when you install a new comfort system, you'll get up to $2,250 off. With bad weather on the way, now is the best time to buy. Visit PacificHeatingAndCooling.com. I love watching cheese melt. It's like a nature documentary. The flowing rivers of cheese spread quickly across the landscape. Oh, can I? Nope. Now for $8, get a large pepperoni pizza. We make it, you bake it. Papa Murphy's. Grab free play, cash, and more this October at Tulalip. Join the drawings every Sunday to pocket your share of a guaranteed 20 grand. Find all the details online or download the new One Club Go app today. It's not if, but when an earthquake occurs, will you be two weeks ready? Join us for the Great Washington Shakeout, the world's largest earthquake and tsunami drill on October 17th. What would your family do after a disaster? Start talking and get prepared at shakeout.org slash Washington. If you receive Como TV Channel 4 in Seattle via antenna, you'll need to rescan the channels on your digital receiver on or after 1 a.m. on October 19th. But if you have cable or satellite, your signal will not be affected. Rescanning is simple and requires no new equipment or services. For more information on how to rescan your TV's tuner, visit FCC.gov forward slash rescan or call 1-888-CALL-FCC. Rescan your channels after 1 a.m. on October 19th to continue receiving Como TV in Seattle. So what happens when thousands of people in a city are left out to live in the elements, in filth, with little or no sanitation, a poor food supply, little or no medical attention? I went down to Los Angeles to visit that city's Skid Row area, and I'll be honest, I've never seen anything like it, and I hope I never do again. This story should serve as a cautionary tale about our own future, and I'm not just talking about Seattle or the West Coast, I'm talking about all of these United States. <laughs> For so long, for so many, it was a dream. Suntans and movie stars and surfing songs and infinite possibility. California dreaming. The same sun still shines down on Los Angeles, and for many, the dream is still golden, still very real. But there is a thing happening in LA, a vast failure that is making people afraid, and they should be afraid. This is Skid Row in Los Angeles, and none of the things you see here, the garbage and the filth and the degradation, is shocking to those of us in Seattle. We see it almost every day. But the sheer volume of it here, the enormity of it all, is truly mind-boggling, and it has opened the doors to some next-level problems that are horrifying. It is 53 square blocks of suffering and mental illness and drugs on a level that is hard to fathom. When I first got here, I was a man. But after being here for nine years, it took a toll on me. And now I'm, I don't feel like a man anymore. And now, bubbling at the surface, is the long ignored cousin of addiction and homelessness disease. We have not seen conditions for humans like this since medieval times. Period. And that's a fact. But if you get Dr. Stable, Drew Pinsky is scared and outraged, and on his radio show in L.A., he no longer holds back. Tuberculosis is exploding, non-tuberculous acid fast bacilli exploding, and then the rat-borne illnesses, plague and typhus. And then we had typhoid fever last week. I, even I didn't think that, I, didn't, I missed that. I mean, so typhoid fever means, oh, now we have oral fecal contamination, so that's going to mean parasites and cholera. Here we go, everybody. Just everything you, everything you found in your history books, we got it. It's coming. He says that bubonic plague, Black Death as it was known, which killed 25 million people over a five-year period in the Middle Ages, is likely already present in L.A. It is caused by fleas biting rats and spreading it to humans, and an army of rats, millions strong, has overthrown Los Angeles. They have infested City Hall. The LAPD station in downtown L.A. was fined by the state for rodent infestation. Two employees have been infected by typhus. Cops have been diagnosed with typhoid fever, hepatitis A, and staph. This is the end of it right here. We're really close to the end of whatever our existence on this earth is going to be. Skid Row has been in L.A. for a long time, but not like this. Never like this. There's over a thousand registered sex offenders 
on the streets of, of Skid Row. Andy Bale is the CEO of the Union Rescue Mission in the epicenter of Skid Row. His life's work is saving lives here. People get beaten, uh, women get raped. Um, it's just a brutal environment. He looks out now and he too is scared. He too is outraged. This is real. Yeah, it's, it's real and you know, who knows? This is like a Petri dish for disease. He knows. While delivering water to the people he serves, he contracted staph, E. coli, and strep. It cost him his leg. And the lost souls on the streets below have no idea what they're up against. I mean, is it a life or death situation? No. I mean, it's just a part of life being sick. It's been easy enough for most people to ignore the plight of Skid Row, but then it started to spread. Homelessness is exploding here, up 16% in one year, 36,000 wandering the streets of Los Angeles, 59,000 in LA County. In the shadow of iconic buildings, there are tents now. Right outside beautiful City Hall, there are tents. On Alvarado Street, a man walks out into traffic to avoid the filth. At Venice Beach, called the new Skid Row by some, tents and the things that come with them are on full display. Jill Stewart is the head of the Coalition to Preserve LA. And there's a lot of butt covering going on. Oh, we did a great job last week. Oh, fantastic press conference. And I'm just, I'm at the point where if the city council and the mayor don't do something innovative and dramatic pretty soon, we're going to spend every single day putting out press releases about how incompetent they are. The camps pop up only where they are allowed. Manhattan Beach, for instance, is pristine. Look at this. Under this overpass on the 405, on one side, there is nothing. On the other side, a line of tents and garbage. That's because one side is in Culver City. Culver City doesn't allow them. The other side is in Los Angeles. Los Angeles does. The health risks are everywhere. Miranda, on the streets for four years now, knows. Particularly hepatitis A is very rampant out here. That's one of the, the, big, the big ones, but this scabies is just a plethora of, of, of health risks and problems out here. Los Angeles spent $620 million to fight homelessness last year. The successes have been dwarfed by the failures. Many insist that City Hall has been paralyzed by indecision, all the while assuring the public that things are under control. If you live in Seattle, perhaps that sounds familiar. Behind the veneer of the gorgeous sunsets and the vast wealth of sunny Southern California, nobody talks about good vibrations anymore. They talk about disease and despair and how the dream went so very wrong. The worst man-made disaster in the United States, by far, it's 53 square blocks of abandoned people who've been really left to die. Uh, you don't really live on Skid Row, you, you come here to die. It was the place to go for your dreams and now it's the place to go with your nightmares. Do you feel like you're shouting into the wind? I am screaming into the wind and it, I feel like, and I feel this way every day, like I'm standing on a railroad track and the train is coming and I know the bridge is out and I'm like, hey, stop, stop, stop. And the engineers are looking at me and give me the finger. We are on the eve of really serious trouble. There are just over 10.1 million people in Los Angeles County, and there's an estimated 12 million rats. It's easy to see why disease is such a huge concern there. And that shot you saw of Culver City right next to Los Angeles is reminiscent of the difference between what happens in Seattle and what happens in Bellevue, isn't it? Where it is allowed to happen, it happens. Where it is not, it doesn't. When we come back, what has changed since Seattle is dying first came out and what has not. Our newest arrivals are on sale. This holiday weekend at More Furniture for Less. You'll find sale pricing in every department throughout the showroom. The newest styles for your home are in stock and on sale. Get our guaranteed lowest prices on everything store-wide. It's this holiday weekend at More Furniture for Less. Preview sale items online at morefurniture.com.
It's time for Sleep Number's fall sale on the Sleep Number 360 smart bed. You can adjust your comfort on both sides, your Sleep Number setting. Can it help keep us asleep? Absolutely. It intelligently senses your movements and automatically adjusts to keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And snoring? No problem. And done. So you can really promise better sleep. Not promise, prove. Don't miss our weekend special. The Queen Sleep Number 360 C4 Smart Bed is now only $13.99. Plus 0% interest for 24 months and free premium delivery when you add a base. Ends Monday. So what has happened since March after Seattle's dying first aired? What changes have we made? There are new developments for sure, including new ideas coming from the mayor's office. Let's get back out to Matt Markovich. Matt, what kind of changes are we talking about? Well, Eric, just after the special air, Mayor Jenny Durkin of Seattle convened a special work group of city and county prosecutors, law enforcement, the courts, to look at what they called high barrier individuals. That's the subset of people we've been talking about all throughout this show. But these high barrier individuals are also repeat offenders. The status quo is no more. Seattle and King County lawmakers have announced something brand new, a regional homeless authority. Coming together to say we need to tackle this together. It's a new entity, some say a new layer of bureaucracy that will take control over Seattle's network of shelters and social and outreach services and combine it with King County's network of treatment and behavioral health services. Lawmakers say it's needed to break down the budget silos but not everyone agrees. When you get a Seattle Center group appointing 11 experts, no accountability to the public, that is a recipe for disaster. The city of Seattle has also quietly stepped up the cleanup of tent encampments in the downtown core, citing more camps as health and safety hazards, which necessarily do not need a 72-hour warning notice before camp is cleared. I broke out every window with that gas. The timing suggests the issues of repeat offenders brought up in Seattle is dying. People like Travis Berge returning to the streets only to reoffend may have led to the creation of a work group headed by Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin on how to handle what they call high barrier individuals. Too many people have been discharged directly into homelessness leading to this cycle. The work group has now proposed a series of pilot programs catering to the people with behavioral health, drug issues and long criminal records including spending $4 million to renovate a portion of the King County Jail into a treatment center for 60 people. This is not creating some kind of minimum security detention facility. This is an enhanced shelter with 24-hour services. No one is going to be compelled or forced to reside there. Another pilot project they announced would be what's called enhanced probation, where there would be an exchange. An offender would get less jail time if they agree to go and stay in treatment. But in many ways, that's already going on. Where all the money will come from to pay for everything is still a big question. So, Matt, we've got work groups and a regional authority, new layers of government. But what about the actual policies? Are the tents still allowed, for instance? Are people still allowed to carry three grams of heroin or meth without any fear of prosecution? And do we still refuse to actually intervene in these lives that are out of control? Well, the answer to all three of those questions is basically yes. The existing policies that were before the special air still exist, and people say it's about enforcement and tolerance. Uh, for an example, let me just show you what's where I am right now at this camp. This is a sign that's right in front of the camp. It says no trespassing or camping in an emphasis zone. And I'm standing right here in this red zone right here. This was set up, these emphasis zones were set up by the city of Seattle to make immediate action that if you camp here, you're going to be immediately removed. This camp behind me has been here for weeks. This much we know. We have work to do, don't we? All of us. And here at Como, we're not going to let go of this. We're not going to go away until the suffering on our streets goes away and the deterioration of our way of life. If you have a story for the Project Seattle team, call this number, 206-404-4732, or email projectseattle at comonews.com. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.